Welcome to our next edition of CanAge Conversations. Today we're talking to Carrie Baisley, CanAge Fellow, Metis, Indigenous advocate, person who's been on the front lines of the COVID response for BC from the very beginning since Linden Valley. I know that you're going to enjoy and learn more about not just his leadership, but also his career on the stage. For more information about CanAge and to make sure that you don't miss a thing, make sure to sign up for a free membership at canage.ca slash join. That's C-A-N-A-G-E dot C-A slash join. Also make sure to follow us on social media on our Facebook page, YouTube channel, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Don't want to miss any of the wonderful newsletters we put forward, cutting edge topics, and to learn more about the advocacy work we're doing on behalf of older Canadians. Let's get to it now. Welcome everybody. My name is Laura Tamblin Watson. I'm the CEO of CanAge, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. And I'm so delighted to welcome you today to a fireside chat, CanAge Conversations with my dear friend, Carrie Baisley, who's also a fellow of CanAge. And Carrie is joining us from the West Coast today. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, you're welcome. So let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? Were you born in Canada? Tell me a little bit about your family. Okay, uh, born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and uh, one of three children. I have a twin brother and a sister five years younger. Dad was a fireman, mom was a nurse, and we moved from there to Powell River when I was in grade six. So you went from the middle of Canada to the edge of Canada, and you, but you didn't always stay there, didn't you? Your professional career took you to a few other places in Canada. So where else have you lived? Uh, I lived in the Yukon for a year uh, in uh, Whitehorse, and uh, that's about it, actually, in Vancouver for the rest of the time. So let's talk a little bit about some of the identities that you have, because you actually are very involved in a number of different passion areas. You're an art collector, you are connected with the Anglican church, but more recently you have become much more involved with your Métis heritage. Tell us a little bit about how you discovered that and kind of what your Métis heritage has meant to you. Okay, yes. Uh, so to, to get Métis heritage is a genealogy search, unlike a uh, status Indian. So you do a search and part of that search, which I knew from the Hudson Bay Company and from the maternal side in the, uh, the Paw, Manitoba, you have to practice. I believe you have to practice. So with that, the Indigenous Friendship Center in Vancouver has a weekly gathering of Métis people. So I go to that. So it's more discovering and learning. And I found them very welcoming and helpful. When we last had a chance, you provided the Indigenous Welcome for National Seniors Day with the Minister for Seniors and a number of key stakeholders across the country. And you know, we're so used to a land acknowledgement as sort of a common beginning or start to a session. And I asked you if you would do a Métis acknowledgement. It's a little bit different. Can you tell me a little bit about that, what that practice is? Right, well, the Métis people didn't have land. They were the people of the roadways, though beside the roads, that was the land they were left with uh, when it was in the history. So with that, the gathering is partly with the indigenous people as well. So the idea of the day, the creator, the earth, all the things that swim, fly, walk. So it's about being in the world and being together with it. Is that has that changed your perspective, your practice, your Métis culture, or does that blend into existing thoughts and practices that you had before you became more involved with it? It makes it more aware because when they use the, when we use the word and the many people use it, all my relations, the all my relations actually includes the living beings, which is the wildlife, the animals, the birds, the fish as well. And that makes it that you're a custodian of those things and related to them. So that changes it. You've had a lot in your career about caring for people. You've been committed to caring for people you know, in a number of different ways. I just want to open it up. Tell me about your career path because it's been fascinating all the way through. So you head off to university and what happens then? Where do you go and, and what's, what's your journey? 
Well, I was thinking of theology, but decided against it. So then I took a degree in social work. And when you are a de first degree social worker, it's child welfare. So I did emergency child welfare because I didn't want a caseload. So I worked with CAR 86 with the police in Vancouver. And after five years of working on and off in that area, I needed a full-time job before I wanted to go into hospital social work. So that's when I went to the Yukon for uh, social development for one year. And after that, came back to school and then worked at uh, UBC Extended Care, then the Public Guardian Trustee, and then became Director of Risk Management at Richmond Hospital. Then retired and then came back to help out and a six week program became 23 months of work. Uh, which I'm just let's, let's dig a little bit more into that. So when you and I first met, which was, I have to say, almost two decades ago at this point, when you and I first met, I was yeah. brand new. I had a brand new organization called the Canadian Center for Elder Law, and you were really heading up a lot of the decisions and issues about adult guardianship and the public guardian trustee. And I knew immediately that there was a kinship there and that you had a real commitment to sort of spreading the word about how to support people. So your time at the Public Guardian Trustee, let's dig into that a little bit. Tell us in BC, what is the, that kind of adult guardianship or adult decision-making, what does that look like? What do you end up doing? Well, part of it was the, the, making, of the uh, making of the policies, putting a team together. We had a specific team for substitute decision-making as, as the decision of last resort if no one else could be found. And part of it was trying to help the public guardian understand because I was involved in healthcare and how do you make law work? So that was pretty well a lot of the job. And the other thing I would have said, my main motto was substitute decision-making is a responsibility. And I think a lot of people think of it as an authority or a power, which is the wrong way to go about it. That's really interesting. So when we're talking about substitute decision-making, Many people don't realize that if you uh, haven't made um, a document like a power of attorney in BC or in Yukon and Nova Scotia, they'll call them a representation agreement for personal and healthcare decisions or a power of attorney for property and financial decisions. But if you don't have one, and if it's a healthcare decision, there's a default list, which is kind of the people that you would expect it would be a little bit different in every province, but it's, it's kind of like your spouse, partner and adult children and parents and you know, siblings and that type of thing. BC's got some additional, you know, grandparents and a close friend in there. Some of the other provinces don't have it. But, you know, uh, many people don't realize that there's no default list for property. And if you don't have a power of attorney for property and you haven't had a court appointed guardian or committee, you know, it comes to the public guardian trustee. And so you really are the last resort when you're wearing that public guardian trustee hat. You're going into people's lives and you're making decisions about that um you know about their well-being or their finances and whatever I i'm curious you know maybe you could share with me a, a story or two about you know kind of poignant moments when you were kind of at the bedside at the bank making decisions for somebody who was in your care well i guess right at the beginning uh, I, I thought a cute story was helping the banks to understand the authority because the idea was to say that when we said we wanted to put a freeze on an account, they said, oh, we'll take it under advisement. I said, no, no, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. And if you don't do it, you'll be liable. Give me the manager now, please. And <laughs> when I said the word liable, then the ears pricked up. So that was how to teach banks. Uh, one of the things with substitute decision-making was, uh, was saying there was an individual who had been in a car accident second time, sadly. And there was no way to make decisions, but the people at the front desk had said, we said to them, if we put all out and he survives, he will be in institutional care. It's pretty well a given. How would he like that? And the answer was, he would hate it. So he said, okay, with that information, he said, then maybe we will do what we can to keep him comfortable and see what happens, but not push to a level of like ICU, because we think that's what he would have wanted. It was based on his determination of quality of life, not anyone else's, not mine, not, not the healthcare professions. So that's the kind of stuff that we learned. And the last one would be that somebody was on antibiotics for, for two weeks and they asked, should we do it again? And we said, what are the chances of improvement? And we looked at the, at the 
uh, he had pneumonia. And I said, there's been no improvement over two weeks of antibiotics. We took off the antibiotics and he died within an hour. The staff were shocked. But what I said was, if you think about it, it was holding him, but not curing him. So in one way that, so those are some of the stories that, yeah. that helped uh, show it. It really shows that you know, we have to be making decisions based on what that person would want, their values, wishes, and beliefs. It's not the wishes of the decision maker, but it is a really interesting responsibility to be, if you will, the, the last resort decision maker. You went from there into Richmond, you know, the Richmond hospital system, and you, you kind of took a step up in a way. You were trying to help understand risk management and those types of things. And that led you again to coming out of retirement during times of COVID-19. I want to dig into that a little bit. So you were on the front end of the COVID-19 outbreak in Canada. Tell us that story. Well, yeah, I'm not laughing at it. I'm laughing at it. My plan was after helping out for six weeks that became, um, that became about, 20, uh, about 13 months, I was going to retire March 13th, because I thought Friday the 13th, which is this is the next Friday the 13th, I thought that would be a little funny to quit Friday the 13th. Of course, COVID came to us via uh, Lynn Valley Care Center on March 5th. So uh, the plan to retire went out the window and then I got asked by Karen Olson, the CEO, to be the, the liaison from the liaison with the families at Lynn Valley. Lynn Valley at the time was without a social worker. And the, the partnership between Vancouver Coastal Health and Lynn Valley was to work together to try and collectively do the best everybody could. So that was the job that I took. It ended up being from that March till, till June. So that was what I did. Uh, going every day, meeting the staff, meeting, going to the meetings and then meeting families as was needed. There was such fear at the beginning, and we've learned so much since that, you know, that early time. You know, what do you think are some of the lessons that we learned out of the outbreak in the first wave from the BC perspective? As I say, you were first on the ground in, if you will, the response at Lynn Valley. What do you think that we've figured out since that time? I think BC was lucky to have a structure where the three components, facility care, hospital, and community, those are sort of the three pieces of the puzzle, work together and things like uh, PPE, getting the PPE, all of that was sent from the hospital to Lynn Valley. We did the ordering and the, and the organizing and sending there. They just had to say, how much do you need each, each every three days? So that's the kind of stuff we, uh, we learned the other thing to learn is that who are the, the frontline people and it's actually the care aides. Doctors and nurses have some roles, but the real, real frontline are the care aides and how do we support them and how do we give them jobs that are a pay that makes them able to stay in one place. That's the stuff that's still being worked on. I want to take a, a turn a little bit further. I want to dig into a little bit of some of the other parts of your personality. So, you know, together you have always been a storyteller. You know, you have always been at the center of that storytelling, but you took storytelling to a new level. You got on a stage and took up stand-up comedy. T tell me that story. Well, my family, uh, we come from a family that are good storytellers and jokers. And I don't know if it's a combination of Irish and indigenous, but with that, I decided, well, I think I can do that. So let's try it for real. So upon the first wave of retirement, I ended up enrolling in a, in a stand-up course and in a storytelling course. And I even sent one story, CBC didn't like it, but that's okay. <laughs> it was called the, um, the Night I Almost Met Leonard Cohen. So uh, it was a Halloween story and um, a true story in Los Angeles. And then I've done two stand-up comedy sessions uh, in, for, um, for our graduations. The latest one I'm working on, I believe uh, rather than telling jokes about others, it's telling jokes about yourself. So my new one about aging is gonna be called Lotions, Potions and Pills. 
<laughs> yes, we need that. We all need a little bit of a laugh. Never before, I think, have we needed the medicine of laughter that we do, I think, right now. You have a strong connection to the arts. Your partner is a singer, uh, very involved in choirs, and you yourself are an art collector and and particularly in some indigenous art. How did you get involved in that? And you know, are you wearing anything really gorgeous right now? Uh, well, okay, you asked the question. So there's there's a bracelet. You can, I don't know if you can see that very well. So there's a uh, Alvin Adkins bracelet that I decided when I was working so long, I would uh, I bought that. I had it made. So that was my uh, for all the work that being done. So. Uh, it started when I was working at the UBC Museum. So I worked, at, had the luck of working at the UBC Museum when Bill Reed was around. And from that being exposed to material culture. From there, I met a lady called Dorian Ray and I worked at her antique store. And what we did was we bartered. So uh, from that, I started collecting things around the world. So that sort of started my interest in both cultures and perspectives and gathering things. And so I said, if you call yourself a collector, then you're not a hoarder. So <laughs> it's all about how you frame it. Yes. <laughs> it's all about it. So you were working at the Museum of Anthropology then at UBC. Yes, uh, I, I took five years to do my first degree. And then between the social work degrees, I thought I needed to work because I worked all the way through. So with that, uh, luckily, UBC in those days hired students to be the frontline reception. And I got one of the lucky jobs right at that time when Raven and the first people was being brought in and Prince Charles was coming. I was one of the people at the front desk. And then after that, I worked as a gallery assistant for a year, working with the ladies in the gift shop and then one day a week and working uh, with the designers in the gallery the other day of the week. So that was beautiful just to see all those things and be there. So art and connection has always played a part of that for you. And then the storytelling is a piece that you've woven through right now. So what's next? What's next for you in the arts and culture, in the storytelling and, and artistic sphere? What do you want to be doing or thinking about in the next couple of years? Well, what I've accepted is uh, accepted a, a, a part-time job three days a week with called Missioner uh, for Indigenous Justice at the Diocese of New Westminster, which is the Anglican Diocese in the Lower Mainland. With that, I see that like so many of my jobs, it's been about building relationships. So it's about looking at the relationships between the churches or parishes, we'd call them, and the wider church and the Indigenous people and the, the community as well. So how do we work to uh, make reconciliation? I don't think, it, I think it's a verb, not a noun. And so how do we make that happen as opposed to you think it's an event? I think it's a process. I want to dig into that just a little bit more. Now, we at CanAge are strong believers in reconciliation. We try to embed that as a piece of continuous learning and continuous engagement. It's a, a critically important part. And I'm coming to you to the from the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq and the Mi'kmaqai. And you know, right now we're in a, a, a time, I think, of transition where people are trying to understand how can they do more around reconciliation in their personal lives as opposed to in their professional lives? Yeah, you've been thinking about reconciliation and impact and stories for a long time. How, how would you respond if someone said to you, you know, what are some ways that I can engage in the process of reconciliation you know, in my personal life? Do you have any thoughts or advice for people on that? I think it would be what you what we've sort of said. Find out well, whose land you're on. Find out where their uh, their places are, and work to try and make some connections with people. And and the other part is the balancing of the difficult past, the horrendous past. But don't focus and stay there. Rather than focus on how resilience is one of the big words. Uh, in the one way that uh, people, some of the indigenous people say, yeah, you tried to kill us off, we're still here. So the idea is that resilience is the thing to build on and look for that and how can you make relationships and resilience? That's what I recommend. Well, the you made me laugh in the middle of a terrible thing. Again, you've got your storytelling 
and your comedy as part of it. I think the role of humor is really important in aging. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, people say you're only as old as you feel. I, I don't think that's true. I think you're exactly as old as you are and how you feel is a different piece of that. And so I, I don't love the idea of, you know, old, having all these sort of negative consequences. I, I, wanna, I wanna just sort of wrap up a little bit with your reflections on aging broadly. Um, you know, you have been working in the field of aging. You've worked across the whole life course. You've worked in the North, you've worked on the coast and you've seen a lot in terms of the best and worst of people. You know, as you're reflecting on aging as a process yeah. and your own aging, what can you leave us with? Okay, I'd leave, I think um, child, being childlike, not childish. <laughs> the idea would be that says, uh, childlike wonder, interest in things, exploring, having fun. If you watch a child walk with, with an elder person, they're not paying attention to going forward. They always look around, backward, forwards, above. So I think that's the kind of thing, as opposed to, if we start making a demand for something, then we are end up be narrowing ourselves. So the goal is to be more open and to engage people and to teach people. Because all of those things, I think if you're open, then you learn. You've always been an inspiration to me and your energy and your curiosity and your imagination has kept, I think, you and all of your relationships engaged with childlike wonder. And, uh, you know, I know that so many people have personally benefited from your expertise, your experience and your wisdom. But when we were starting up CanAge and I was thinking, you know, who do we need in our sphere to help us inspire, promote and be the best we can be? I want you to know that you were the top of my list and this conversation has just been a wonderful chance to connect and to better understand. Okay, advice. I know it's always a dangerous thing. Advice, okay. You've reflected on aging and so on. What do you think that we as a country need to do to become more age inclusive? I know it's a giant question, so you have to answer all of it, but maybe a couple of thoughts that you would have about how Canada can be more age inclusive. You've been thinking about this for a long time. I think the, the idea is to shift perspectives and not see this as a problem, but an opportunity. Not see, when you see this, that uh, how we care for our vulnerable people is a mark of our society. And if we say, see things like people well paid for jobs well done and that we respect them, that in fact we can encourage people and support them, then we can have a community. When you look at the indigenous cultures, the everybody's together. Whereas we think we've gotten into the, the way of putting people in places. So how do we get people back together and help support everyone to do that so that there's an economy and a life and a learning? All of those things are what interest me in, in uh, making community as opposed to making, I used to say, there's no moat around the extended care, but you'd think there was because nobody came over to visit except family. Yeah. And students, if they wanted to tick for <laughs> volunteering, which we made use of, that was good. But <laughs> there's no moat, but you'd think there was. How do we break that down? So aging as an opportunity, aging as a marker of our society, you know, aging as a chance to build community and reconnect with people who are a part. Well, this has been my chance to reconnect being a part, but Carrie, I'm coming out West shortly. So I'm really Great. looking forward to connecting as at least six feet apart from you in person. <laughs> Thanks so very much. So kind of you to take this opportunity. I didn't know if there were any last words that you wanted to leave us with perhaps something from your culture for us all to think about. I'd say when you, we say all my relations, we are all related and we all care for each other. So thank you, all my relations. Thank you, Carrie.